Check one, two, three. They do just send you the link. Oh, there you are. Cool. All right. Bye. All right, my man. I'll highlight you. My, my, go ahead and say something to me. There you go. Cool. I'm trying to, I tried to do it right in the middle and look at the. That's good. Yeah. Do you want to do it sideways or is that good for you right there? I, that's, I think that's fine for me, to, fine for, okay, I'm gonna do is let me throw this on Facebook. We've got five minutes anyway, so it's not a, as big of a deal. What I might do is I might uh, also send a text to a few of the guys um, about the stream. Yeah, Veronica did it for whatever reason. She did it long ways. She set me up long ways, not sideways. Does it matter? Should I try it's to? Up to you. I mean, you can see your you can see your view. You're right now. You're in <clears throat> you're in uh, portrait versus landscape. So it's all depends on. But it doesn't. I mean, it's fine to me. Okay, page manage posting as next. <clears throat> You got to get you some of this, Pastor Jay. This cucumber lime smart water, man, this stuff is good. <laughs> is it? All right, here we go. I'm going to do um, Kingdom Men's. Saturday live stream 4 5 Albert. Bloom. All right. All right, Facebook is going live. So just realize that everything you save from this point on is going to be on there, okay? Got you. It's a beautiful day today. Oh my gosh, yes it is. I stepped outside, the wind is blowing, sun, clear skies. Nice. Oops, there we go. All right. Yeah, it's 9.56, I guess we'll start right at 10. Yeah. All right.
There we go. Yeah, we're on there now. I'm going to go ahead and share it. If you want to go, if you have your Facebook, you could share if you want to do it on your phone. I'm going to share it publicly on mine. How do I do that? So once I see you share it, I can share it from, oh, okay. I got it. We got three folks, might be you and me and somebody else now. <laughs> All right, looks like we've got, hi Andy Jones. Hey Joey, I see you on the Facebook side of things. We're gonna be starting here a couple minutes. Got it, I just shared it. All right, Bill and Vanessa, good to uh, have you guys on there as well. If you guys don't mind taking a moment to actually share it too with your to your uh, friends. All right. Lacey, Ken Roberts, good to see you guys on the Facebook side of things. Excited with the word that Albert's got with us today. So we'll hear, start here shortly. Uh, always grateful to have you guys join us. All right. Well, Al, it's uh, it's ten o'clock here. All righty. Um, well, good to everyone in Facebook land. This would normally be our men's breakfast gathering. Um, obviously, everybody knows the situation, and we're meeting Zoom style on Facebook. Um, so, although this would be a message, I would be teaching the men. This is a message for the body of Christ. Um, you know, God gave me this word a few weeks ago to deliver today. Um, so the title of the message is Kingdom Keys to Destroy Double-Mindedness and Restlessness. Uh, I believe this is a timely word for the times we're in right now. Um, God has all the answers and all the solutions to all the world's problems. I think sometimes we forget that. <laughs> Nothing takes him by surprise. He's not thrown off. He's not in heaven wringing his hands, freaking out. He doesn't do that. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going I'm to give the three main scriptures. They're pretty short. Um, that, that are the scriptures that deal with the issue, the issue of double-mindedness and restlessness. And then in the meat of the message, I'm going to give the, the, the three solutions he gave me. The three solutions with scriptures to back them up for how you beat or destroy double-mindedness and restlessness. So our first scripture will be James verses one, I mean, chapter one, verses two through eight. Then we're going to hop over to Mark 33 through 41. And then we'll hop over to Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Um, so let me go ahead and jump into James. 
read all the scriptures and then we'll, we'll, we'll dissect and break this thing down. <clears throat> it reads, and I'm reading out of the New King James. My brother, and count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without, with no doubting for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. You're gonna see how that wave of a sea driven and tossed by the wind will tie into the Mark text. For let not that man Suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. <clears throat> he is double-minded. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. How much is left after all? <laughs> He's unstable in all his ways. I believe God gave me a key as to why some believers struggle. And I'm a, through the message you see um, clearly why some believers struggle almost their whole life walking with God when that's never for God's intention. But it, that key right there of being double-minded plays a big part in it. Um, the next scripture will be Mark 4, verses 33 through 41. On, and with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. But without a parable, he did not speak to them. And when they were alone, he explained all things to his disciples. Before I get into the main part, which is 35 through 41, I read that because I want to explain kind of something that we sometimes miss in Jesus' ministry. Jesus was very specific in how he did things depending on who he was in front of. That's very key because you can't do a Jesus one blanket approach to everybody. He spoke to the masses one way. He usually used parables to speak to them. He spoke to his disciples, the ones who had given everything up to follow him, in a more clear, direct teaching method, okay? He spoke to the religious folks in a more, kind of, you would say, almost a more, a more harsh and firm tone voice in the way he delivered to the religious sect. So... I hate when people really, it, it's, a, it's a, I guess, a pet peeve of mine, when people try to say Jesus would never do this. Jesus would never do that. That's not how my Jesus is. Well, you better study this word because Jesus dealt with things. He dealt with sinners differently than he dealt with those who claim to know him and his father. So I'm saying that to say as he spoke in parables to the masses. My spiritual father used to say, parables are an instrument of sincerity. They actually locate your level of sincerity. So if I give you a parable, I can find out if you really want to get to know me or you just want fish and bread. Some people only want to follow Jesus for fish and bread. They don't want to intimately know him, right? So the parable locates the heart. It locates the sincerity of the heart. But those that left everything, he spoke to them clearly and plainly. So look, here's the key verse, though. On the same day when the evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling up. But he was in the stern asleep, that's key, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care, that's very important, that we are perishing? They asked him, do you not care? After being with him and seeing his constant care daily. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still, and the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? He said they had no faith. And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? What do you mean, who can this be? You've been walking with him. You've been spending time with him. You've seen him in action. 
why are you amazed? <laughs> it's 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 mind boggling to me, to be honest, to be that close to the presence of the presence of God, and you're still asking questions and wondering if He can do this and does He care? So the other scripture we're going to read is Matthew eight twenty. This is the Matthew account of it, twenty three through twenty seven, and I'm going to read this one from the Passion. They all got into the boat to a boat and began to cross over to the other side of the lake. And Jesus, exhausted, fell asleep. Suddenly a violent storm developed with waves so high the boat was about to be swamped. Yet Jesus continued to sleep soundly. The disciples woke him up saying, save us, Lord, we're going to die. But Jesus reprimanded them. Why are you gripped with fear? Where is your faith? Then he stood up and rebuked the storm and said, be still. And instantly it became perfectly calm. The disciples were astonished by this miracle and said to one another, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey his word. Now, what are the keys that destroy double-mindedness and restlessness? Complete trust, beloved identity, entering God's rest. And we're going to get into the scriptures that back that up shortly. Now, most people, you got to go back to the word when I read the part when they said, do you not care? Most people believe God can do something. Not so many people believe he cares to do something in every scenario. And that's where the disconnect comes in. You know God can. You believe he's sovereign. You believe he's in control. You believe whatever you believe concerning that. Sovereign, in control, or in charge, right? whatever your, your mindset is on that. So you believe he can, but when he doesn't do it the way you think he should do it, you question if he cares. All, although you've got a track record, most of us have, have a track record with him that lets us know he's shown us time and time again he cares. But when certain things arise, certain things that you think are too big for him, all of a sudden you question if he cares. You know he can, but you question if he cares. One very important principle in the Mark and Matthew text, Jesus did not cast out or rebuke a demon. That's very key. Let me say it. Let me say it. I'm going to read it again. Then he arose and rebuked the wind. He rebuked the wind. He didn't rebuke Satan. He didn't rebuke a demon. And then he spoke to the sea and said, peace, be still. Some translations say, peace, be calm, still calm. He spoke, he rebuked, and he spoke to deal with wind and waves. Some of us blame the devil for stuff that the devil don't have nothing to do with. Some of us blame God for stuff that God has nothing to do with. Both of them are very dangerous things to do. Listen to this. <laughs> this is key because who you attribute something to actually really matters. There's God sent. There's God used. There's God allowed. God created this whole universe, everything. In the book of Isaiah, it says he created all things for him, for use by him, everything. He knew the propensity for Lucifer when he made Michael and Gabriel and Lucifer, the big boys, the top dog angels in heaven. He knew Lucifer would have a propensity to do what he did. He was not caught off guard by that either. We have to stop attributing things to the wrong person. Seek the Father's face. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you who, where it came from, because then you know how to properly pray for it, pray into it. See, if you attribute something to the devil and it actually was God sent, then you, you fight in the wrong battle. If you attribute it to God and the devil has something to do with it, you fight in the wrong battle. Sometimes it's some bad decisions we've made. So now you put it on either God or the devil when in actuality, this one was your fault. <laughs> you get it? So <clears throat> very key to know which one something it should be attributed to. It, it's, it's not a light matter, right? It's, it's not a light matter to, to, to like not know what, what this should be addressed to, how you should address it, how you should deal with it. So. You've got to figure that out. I'll never forget when the Holy Spirit had told me one time I was going through a real intense battle. I think this is when we actually had our church. And um, 
he, he spoke these words to me, and this goes in line with this of knowing where something's coming from, what battle you're in, what type of war you're in. He said, son, it's very dangerous, two of the most dangerous things to do. One, the worst, the most dangerous is to be in a war and not know you're in a war. The second most dangerous thing is to actually know you're in a war, but you actually bring the wrong weapon to the fight. The enemy is coming at you with bazookas, rocket launchers, M16s, and you show up to the fight with a bayonet. A bayonet is one of those old school guns with a knife on the end of it. <laughs> you show up to the wall with that when the enemy has the other stuff. What do you think is going to happen to you? You're going to get destroyed. So not knowing what battle you're in is very, is very key to your success in your walk in life with God. You've got to know there's a war going on and you've got to know what weapons, the weapons that God has given you and how to deal with the war that's going on. So the verse I really want to focus on from the three I read is the James verse, but I'm only going to, I'm going to read from three different translations. We've already read it from the New King James. I'm going to read it from the New Living. I'm going to read it from Passion, and I'm going to read it from Amplified to bring the point home. But when you ask him, be sure that, that your faith is in God alone. I'm in James 1 verses 6 through 8, the key verse. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything. What is, um, what's left after, if you, if you can't receive anything, what's left after that? Anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world. They are unstable in everything they do. Now let's look at it from the passion. Just make sure you ask empowered by confident faith without doubting that you will receive for the ambivalent ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next being undecided makes you become like the rough seas driven and tossed by the wind remember what was happening in the boat winds the storm started the winds and the waves went crazy and right here you're seeing in the james narrative that's what it's like when you're double-minded you're up and down just like waves like the rough seas driven and tossed by the wind. You're up one minute, tossed down the next. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the love, from the Lord, when you're in that condition? Amplify says it like this, for truly, let not such a person imagine that he will receive anything he asks for from the Lord, for being as he is a man of two minds. He's hesitant. He's dubious. He's irresolute. He is unstable and unreliable and uncertain about everything. He thinks, feels, and decides. He's, look at that. He's uncertain about everything. He thinks, feels, and decides. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. How much is left after all? Exactly. All means all. That means everything you touch and you do. This is why this message is so important. Because everything you touch and you do when you're double-minded is unstable. Now, this is the reason why God hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And I didn't go there for the sake of time to read the, the account in the book of Revelation. You can do that. Go to the book of Revelation. You'll see where God says these words. I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Because they were double-minded. They were a people of mixture. God hates those who mix his ways with other worldly ways or other religious ways. It's an abomination to him. That's what his word says. Let's go to James 4. Let's go to James 4. So you can see this thing with mixing the world with, with the kingdom, what it does. James 4, 1 through 6, and I'm reading from the New Living. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme, you con people, you manipulate people, that's what the word scheme means, and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and wage war. Here we go back with the wage and war thing. But you're, way, you're fighting the wrong war. You fight and wage war to take it away from them, yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. 
And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. How many of y'all know that God always judges motives? Motives are very important. Here's something we can't do, though, as Christians. We're not called to walk around trying to judge all the motives of our other fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. That's God's job. That's his territory. But God does give us discernment and insight when somebody's motions reveal they, their motives. Then you're supposed to go and pray for that brother or sister in Christ and have the Holy Spirit tell you how you're supposed to move forward concerning whatever that issue is. But you're never supposed to go looking around and playing fruit inspector and trying to just judge people's motives. That's a God thing. God judges the motives of the heart. That's not our job. Now, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. Oh, there we go. That pleasure thing is a killer. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. What do you think the scriptures mean when they say the spirit of God is placed within us? The spirit, when they say, when they say that the spirit of God is placed within us, is filled with jealousy. But he gives us even more grace to stand against such evil desires. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but he favors the humble. Now look at Romans 8 and 7. Here's, the, here's where I'm going to go to break this down. Why this being one foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom, double-minded, divided loyalty, why it does us in all the time. It keeps us unstable. Romans 8 and 7. Look what it says. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And I'm going to give you all the definition of enmity because that's a key word. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. The carnal mind, carno, carno, carnivorous, that's meat eater, your flesh eater. You're always chewing and eating on flesh instead of walking in the spirit. The carnal mind, the one who's always in the flesh, is at enmity with God. The one who wants to dabble in the world and then hop over to the kingdom when he needs something. Enmity means a deep-rooted hatred, a hatred that produces irreconcilable differences. It literally means we can never see eye to eye. You ever saw in a, in a, in a divorce court or you've read, I've read a lot of marriage books. That's my, one of my areas is marriage and family. When, when I've read on these things and when they, they, they list as a divorce reason, irreconcilable differences. Rather than put down all of the things she don't like about him, he don't like about her, what caused this thing to go to where we want to be divorced? They just put irreconcilable differences. That literally means we cannot see eye to eye on the, the important things of life, which means we've decided to divorce. Die is the word to in the Greek. Die, two forces, two force, two force, two forces, two visions. Divorce, we're divorcing because we have division, two visions in all. She sees it one way, I see it another way. Now we have irreconcilable differences. We're at enmity with each other. So what the word is saying here is when you have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom or one foot in relig religiosity, your, your mind is divided. It's, you're double-minded. You're unstable. You have irreconcilable differences with the father. That's not a good thing. <laughs> Could it be that some of us have never experienced certain aspects of God, certain benefits of the kingdom, because we have been double-minded in the majority of our time as being a Christian? Could it be that God has deemed certain things off limits until we are stable in our minds, wholehearted, right? By being of single-minded focus on seeking first the kingdom, sitting at the feet of Jesus from a posture of his rest, seated and rooted in beloved identity and having complete trust in God's goodness and his kindness. I believe God gave me a key. This is why some Christians are sad and down and bitter and angry and judgmental and always offended. It's because they're double-minded and they're restless. And Jesus gave us in this word all of the solutions to not live like that, to live a life of peace and joy and rest and beloved identity. 
it's all here, but we have to apply it. Kind of like the flaming, when I say it, he has deemed certain things off limit. He, he reminded me of when Adam and Eve fell and did what they did in the Garden of Eden. What did God do? He placed the cherub with the flaming sword to protect them now from going eat from the tree of life. You can't access this now. And I believe there's certain parts of the kingdom that are, they're literally flaming swords blocking it, blocking your access, kingdom key blockers, keeping you from accessing the tree of life because you're double-minded and you're restless. So the scripture, remember, I, I gave y'all, I don't remember, I may have, I may have not, but here's the three things that destroy double-mindedness and restlessness. One, complete trust. Two, beloved identity. Three, God's rest. So I got scriptures for all of this. Let me read them to you. I'm going to start with the complete trust. And I'm going to share with you all the revelation God gave me years ago on trust and obedience. So complete trust, Proverbs 3, we all should know this scripture. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8. It's a classic scripture. We all quote it, but sometimes I don't think I don't think many of us actually take it to heart to the degree we should. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. How much is all? All is all. I mean, there's no space or spot left for anything else. In all your ways, acknowledge him. All, not some, not 75%. And he shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Why am I reading that second part? Because here's the key. Here's another reason why God showed me a lot of his children are in health crisis and they're, they're not well on the inside. Their bodies are not functioning well. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Let, let's go back over it again quick. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, his ways, the way he thinks, the way he does things, and he shall direct your path. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, depart from evil, then that will produce what? Health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Could it possibly be because we don't trust him completely? We don't acknowledge him in all our ways and we don't walk in the fear of the Lord and we don't depart from evil, that we have internal health issues going on and our bones are decaying and they're falling apart when they wouldn't if we would just apply those principles. Just something to think about. Beloved identity, Matthew 3.17. That's the scripture for beloved identity. There's a few spots where he spoke beloved identity. I just, for the sake of time, just pulled one of them out. You could also read the uh, Matthew 17 account on the Mount of Transfiguration, but I'm going to just read this one for the sake of time. Matthew 3.17. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. My beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Until you understand he calls you his beloved son or daughter and he's well pleased with you, you will, you will struggle with double-mindedness and restlessness. And then the final one, we're going to go to Hebrews. Hebrews 3, and I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. God's rest, God's rest. Hebrews 3, 10 and 11. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their hearts. There's that heart thing again. And they have not known my ways. They drift into error in their hearts and they don't know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. You don't want that to happen. Entering God's rest has conditions. We're going to see as I close, when I close the message, I'm going to read the whole context of Hebrew because you need to see how many times God brought up the importance of rest and how many things, things kept you from entering a rest and how many conditions were attached to entering his rest. I need us to see that because it's not something, God's rest is not something that just, just, just going to fall on you. Like it's just, just going to happen out of the blue. So that's very, very important. Just so y'all know. All right, now, we're getting close to closing, and I'm going to 
deal with a few key things in a second. All right, so let's go back to this. I want to reiterate this principle. Until you believe he cares, you will always wrestle with double-mindedness, restlessness, and a lack of trust. Until you believe he cares, I know most of us believe he can, but until you believe he cares, you're going to wrestle with double-mindedness, restlessness, and a lack of trust. I heard a powerful quote the other day, and I think it applies to double-mindedness and restlessness. We cannot see the kingdom of God without being born again. But not all who bo are born again clearly see the kingdom. And that is, that, is a, that is backed by scripture because Jesus broke down seeing the kingdom and entering the kingdom when he had his discourse with Nicodemus. So it's possible for you to be born again and not clearly see the kingdom. I, I, I hate to say this, and I hate to go over this, but the reality is in Matthew 13, 18, when it says the only message Satan comes after is the kingdom message. So some are born again right now, but they don't clearly see the kingdom because Satan has come and literally pulled away the kingdom understanding, the little they're getting, and literally come against them getting the fullness of the understanding of the kingdom because he knows once they get that, they're unstoppable. Now, I jumped ahead of myself because um, I forgot to share the revelation with y'all on the trust thing. Back when, when I had a, a ministry out church, I did a teaching call, OT produce, produces TO. OT produces TO. OT over time produces trust and obedience. Trust and obey, it's the only way. Here's what the Holy Spirit reminded me of the pr a real key principle about trust. In order for your trust and obedience to grow, you have to spend over time with the Father. You can't give him leftover time. Oh, that's a word for somebody right there. You can't give the Father leftover time and expect to trust him, especially when pandemics and crisis happen. If you've not spent overtime, OT, all of us sports people, we love when games go to overtime. It's exciting. But are we giving God his overtime? Are we giving him left overtime? Trust and obey. Your trust and your obedience will not develop unless you're spending overtime with him. Not in a religious sense, because you love him and you always want to be in his presence and sitting at his feet as much as you possibly can. Not out of religious duty, but because he's your father He's good, he's kind, and you are walking in beloved identity and you're walking in God's rest, and you know that is the key to your trust and obedience. So remember that OT produces TO. Over time produces trust and obedience. You give him leftover, give him what's left after you've done everything else throughout the day, your trust and obedience probably won't be there when, when some of these storms of life come and they're coming. Jesus said there's no way around it. Storms are coming. It rains on the just and the unjust, the word says. Now, look at this. <clears throat> I think the statement of we cannot see the kingdom of God without being born again, but not all who are born again clearly see the kingdom. I think that statement has to do with when someone is born again into a, a more religious environment. What do you mean by that, prophet? What I mean by that is <laughs> if they didn't get saved or come in, to their relationship in a kingdom environment, the chances are they may truly be born again, but they're, they're missing out on all that the kingdom has from them because the religious environment is set up to, to do that. Let me explain. And religion promotes restlessness. Religion promotes being double-minded. That religious spirit promotes those things. The Bible talks about in Matthew 23 that the religious folks would put heavy burdens on people and they wouldn't lift a finger to help you deal with it. They put heavy burdens on you that you can't bear, wearing you out with all types of activity. That's what happens when you get born again in a religious environment as opposed to a kingdom environment. Now, let me read the scripture from Hebrews. And we're going to close. I'm going to read it. It's, it's a little long, but I want y'all 
to really take this in and soak this in. It is very, very key because this is the, the, the top principle of the conditions and the things connected with um, entering God's rest. So I'm starting from Hebrews 3.11 and I'm reading all the way through 4.13. And this is very key because to grasp it, you've got to have the whole context of it. All right. So look what it says. Hebrews 3.11. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart, in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Lest any of you harden, be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end while it is while it is said today if you will hear his voice do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion for who having heard rebelled indeed was it not all who came out of egypt led by moses now with whom he was angry 40 years was it not with those who sinned whose corpses fell in the wilderness whose corpse corpses fell in the wilderness and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? Who couldn't enter his rest? Those who did not learn trust and those who didn't obey. You see how this is connecting? If you don't have trust and trust him completely and you don't obey him, you cannot enter his rest. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. The Bible says unbelief is actually sin. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, there is a promise of entering his rest. Let us fear, fear the Lord, lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do not enter that rest. For we who have believed do not enter that rest. I mean, do enter that rest. Not do not. My bad. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, it shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. There's that obedience word again. Here we go back to this obedience word. Trust and obey. It's the only way. And again, he designates a certain day by saying in David, today after such a long time, as it has been said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward, he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Y'all see how many times this resting is mentioned in this short verse and chapters? Lest anyone fall, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, tying in the heart thing again. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Wow, 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 wow. So I looked up the word when he said they didn't mix together Faith. So the gospel that was preached didn't profit them. It's the it's the Greek word suger su sug karanumi. Sug karanumi. That's a weird word. That's that's the way it's spelled. To mix together, to mingle, to blend together, to temper by mixing, mixing. Translation, mix and temper together. It seems to be an idea taken from the human body, which is kept alive. This is good. By proper mixing of the food with the saliva and the gastric juices in our intestines, in our stomach. Should this mixture not take place or not work, 
such food would actually become death to you rather than life. Wow. So here the gospel does not profit unless it's properly mixed, blended together with faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God has obligated himself to bless only those who believe and obey. In closing, I want to reiterate that the man who is single-minded on the things of the kingdom, seek first the kingdom, put on the mind of Christ, sit at his feet. I call it the Mary principle. Sit at his feet. He is stable in all his ways. We have to believe if the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, the single-minded man is stable in all his ways. Some things you can reverse. If the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways, the sing not, when I say single-minded, I'm talking about a kingdom man. I'm not talking about the single-minded man in the world who is locked into accomplishing a goal, and that goal may be demise. He may fulfill that goal. That's not what I'm talking about. So I honestly now believe, after God has really illuminated this truth to me, that this is the reason for the great chasm in the body of Christ, where you see some struggle for seemingly their whole life, never coming into the fullness that God created for them to walk in. Some, it seems, they actually fulfilled their calling and their purpose in walking at a level of peace and joy that is beyond the understanding. So the three kingdom keys that I want to close with, which is the, the, the meat of the message, trust him completely, beloved identity, entering God's rest. Those three destroy double-mindedness and they destroy restlessness. And I close, let me close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this word. We thank you that you allow us through technology to come together and hear your word from heaven to help your children navigate what's going on on the planet today. Father, I pray that your word will not return to you void. It will do exactly what you sent it to do, that it will produce fruit in keeping with repentance and that we will see tangible results from walking a life of trusting you, resting in beloved identity and entering your rest. And we pray and ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, uh, before we uh, sign off, that's a, that's a just really good message. I, I just want to take a second because we've got a couple minutes here uh, just to uh, kind of unpack something that as you're talking this thing through. When you talk about rest for you, what does that look like in this season? Um, it's not striving. It's not performing. It's not trying to do religious duties just to check it off the list. I read six chapters in my Bible today. I prayed three hours a day. I've, I've been there. I've done it that way. That's not the same. I'm so grateful that I've learned, one, I have to give you full credit for the beloved identity part. Because before coming to Legacy, I didn't have that peace. I had some pieces, but I didn't have that peace. Now that I have that peace, and now that I'm learning the rest piece, it literally has changed my whole life, my whole walk how I view him. I don't view him as angry and he's going to get me if I fall or make a mistake. That beloved identity and that rest allows me to not be double-minded. It allows me to not, you know, struggle with the trust like I did when unjust things happened. I just recently had a very unjust thing happen and I was able to navigate that through that with a peace and, and being in rest because of, of this beloved identity and rest um, thing that I've you know, learn in, in, in these past few years. That's, that's really good. You know, I think when you're talking about that aspect of rest and beloved identity, that's the whole point of the rest is I'm actually resting in who he is and his capacity, his character, his, his ability to, to work all things out in a way that would be beyond what I had the possibility of ever doing in my best day you know, on that. And when you talk about that, it reminds me of the rest of that, that verse it, when you're reading in, I think it was in Hebrews four, that after that, after that point where you stopped, it said that, you know, so therefore we've got a high priest, I think it is, um, who Jesus Christ, who's gone through and has been tempted in every way we're tempted yet was he was without sin. You know, he, he uh, sympathizes with our weaknesses, you know, and so because of that, um, let's boldly come to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and grace. And I think that's an aspect of it. So what am I doing when I'm approaching the throne of grace or I'm coming before the throne of God is, is I'm, I'm actually boldly coming to, to him because I know I can access the rest, which with it comes the capacity to actually rest. Guess what? Guess what? Then when you brought that up, the, guess what my Bible has for that next part you just read? 
it's, you know, they give titles and some of the, each thing to kind of let you know what's going on. It says our compassionate high priest, yeah. meaning he full compassion as our high priest for us, right? <laughs> our compassionate yes. high priest. Which circles back around to something you started off at the very beginning, talking about the care of God. Um, you know, that, that if I don't think he cares, then why would I ever come to him? And so the view that I have of the Father is so incredibly important so that um, I'm not uh, withholding myself from him. But it's, it's really what I'm doing is when I withhold myself from him, I'm actually keeping the best part of him from being able to help me. And so understanding that his capacity always, always is in alignment with his care, his character. So he's always kind. And that's why I think in Romans, it talks about the kindness of God is what leads to repentance that causes me to think differently is because I actually know he's kind. But if I don't think he's kind, then I'm not actually ever going to draw into him. And that's where then if he's not kind, there's no rest that's possible for an unkind God. <laughs> and that also goes to when you when you bring up that part it also goes into the that he can most people i've talked to who struggle with god or view god wrong it's that it's that i call it that dichotomy or that chasm of they really believe in their heart god can do something but because he didn't show up the way they wanted him to now they question if he cares and a lot of believers that struggle with viewing god correct they have that issue pastor jay you know what i mean they really they, they're like, I know God could have done this, but he didn't do it for me. And so now you go into that place of you really don't believe he cares about what you're going through. Now it produces you're, you're unstable because the, you start, I think, one thing about God, but then I think this about God. And you're flip-flopping. And it, you know what I mean? And it produces the restlessness. Because with, without you knowing he's good, he's kind, he's going to work all things out all things together for your good and that he actually cares you're going to be double-minded you're going to be restless yeah right i mean that's it <laughs> well when you think about it from a human perspective hum humanity i remember when papa jack talked about the revelation of uh do you want me to you know love the lord with all your heart soul mind and strength and how the lord to talk to him said jack do you think i'm looking for your love I'm actually letting you, I'm wanting you to let me love you so you can love me back with the same love I love you with. And then you can love the others. And, it, and I think it's the same thing um, from the fickleness of the human heart. If I don't think somebody cares about me, it's hard for me to care about what they care about. Right. And, and that's where this gets into this level of I don't trust you. So why would I even care about what you have to think? And so when people don't recognize that God is caring or when the body of Christ has presented a God that's angry, that is um, bitter, that is up and down, ready to zap you at the last th thing, just because of your disobedience, then, then I think he's an uncaring God. So why would I actually care to follow him? But when we demonstrate the fact that he actually cares and it's in his care, his correction is from a per, per, you know, point of perspective of love. It's actually from a perspective of care. And, you know, you and I are both fathers. And so when we correct our children, it's because we love them. We care about them. We don't want them to experience the negativity of the world. So we correct them. And then that brings them into alignment. And so I think it's even in the same perspective when you're talking about obedience versus disobedience. If you love me, you obey my commandments. Why? Because he cares about you, <laughs> you know. And when and then the only way you can know that is if you've got that beloved identity as a son. So that's so good, man. You you've just I love the way that you parse out the scripture, and and are uncompromising in the way that you bring it about. Um, let's let's go and wrap it up uh, with this. If um, I know you prayed and it was good, but what what would be if you could impart um, something through this live stream? Somebody who's listening right now and who's struggling with the care of God. Um, what, what would be something that you'd release over them or pray over them, just impart to them? These, this, this, back to this principle. You have to understand at the core nature of, his, of the Father. He is good, he is kind, and even when things don't make sense and you don't fully understand what his hands is doing in your life, you have to know that if you're his child, he is working it out for your good. You may go through, because the Bible does tell us, Christ is very clear. 
we will go through certain suffering following after Christ. There's no way around that. It's all through the Bible. One of my favorite scriptures is Acts 14, 22, and 23. For we must, through many trials and tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. God is committed to getting you to the final destination, which is you walking and resting in beloved identity, his rest, having peace, having joy unspeakable, full of glory, peace that surpasses the understanding. I love that because when you think about that, peace that goes beyond anything your natural mind can understand, that only can come from God. That only can come from him. So I would impart the peace of God, the joy of God, beloved identity, rest, kind of going back to the seven things he, he gave me at the beginning of the year, the exchange, all of that is in there. The rest, the peace, the joy, beloved identity, and complete trust. That's so key. Trust him. He's not trying to hurt you. He's not trying to harm you. He's not trying to do anything that would bring unnecessary pain on you. Because some people believe that. Don't believe the lie of the enemy. He is good. He is kind. And he is going to take care of you. He's going to see you through this. This thing is not causing heaven to shut down. <laughs> He's sure. got you under his wing. So I leave y'all with that. And I pray you have a blessed awesome day. Well, let me, uh, I feel like we're, we're going to pray one more time on that. And then uh, before we wrap it up in prayer, just, you know, obviously tomorrow we've got our, our normal live stream for our 10, 10 a.m. service. But tomorrow night, Sunday night, 6 p.m., uh, we're going to be having also a special live stream uh, Zoom and, and also here right on Facebook, same place you're watching right now. Uh, and it's going to be a healing ministry time. So if you're dealing with an illness, uh, injury, uh, has maybe it, it didn't have to do with COVID. I mean, there's so many other things that people are dealing with. If you have a family member, a friend, you can you can end up uh, sharing it with them and inviting them on. We're going to have our ministry team that's going to pray for people starting at six o'clock. Uh, we did it last month and it was powerful. We had several testimonies of healing. Uh, we also had someone that um, ended up had come home from hospice. Um, we prayed for him, and uh, he accepted Jesus. He, he received the gospel for the first time and accepted Jesus, and then he just passed away, I think, about a week and a half ago, uh, two weeks ago. Um, so if you talk about timing, that's it's amazing what God is doing. So uh, feel free to join us with that, too. So let me pray for us. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you are releasing exactly what you say you released. That as we boldly come to your throne of grace, that you actually empower us to walk in the fullness of grace. You empower us to walk in the fullness of rest. You walk, you empower us to walk in the fullness of beloved identity. And I just pray right now a breakthrough, Lord God, that, that there would just be a grace to exchange those things, those old belief systems that maybe were contrary to who you are, maybe those old belief systems that were based off of bad experiences or traumatic events that really took place, that Lord, that we would, we would be able to, exp to finish the exchange of those things for your goodness and for your grace and for your healing power to come spirit, soul, and body. And we just bless what you're doing in this time and ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Hey man, now I tell you this all the time. I love you, man. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to have you in my life. Um, there's, there's one of those things that I, I always feel like I get, uh, I grow and I have things cut off of me when, when you preach the word, it's a good thing. So Love you. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, tomorrow. Have a blessed day. Thank you.